The French 2005 harvest is nearing its end. Back in August, winemakers flew in from across the world to share their expertise. And for the past three months, the Lathwaite's flyers have taken the grapes and worked their hardest to make fantastic wines. Tastings are afoot, and the wines have to be at their very best. It's raining in the Bordeaux region, but fortunately for Aussie winemaker John Adams, all the grapes are in. The rest of the work now needs to happen in the cellar. Today we're doing a decouvage, which means we're taking the skins that have been in the ferment in the tank, we're taking that out, and it's going into a press, which is over on the other side of the co-op. The wine has already been drained off. We call it free run, the French call it tegutage, and that's the bulk of our wine. The bit that comes out at the end is much coarser, much more tannic, and we may or may not use it, but we have the option. These tanks contain the unfinished wine for what will be the Lathwaite Merlot. So what happens is, uh, at the moment, you can see this, like this elephant trunk that's going down into the top of the tank is blowing air into the, to the tank to get rid of the carbon dioxide that's in there, which, which comes from the ferment. It also helps blow some of the alcohol out of the tank as well. The guys will then get down inside the tank. There's a little conveyor belt that comes out through the door. From inside the tank, the guys shovel the skins onto this conveyor belt that pulls the skins out. It drops through this white plastic tube down into a pump underneath. It then gets pumped through stainless steel tube up into the press. Really very simple operation. It's been happening in France for years and years and years and years. It's a very, very labour intensive way of doing it, but um, that's the way they do it here. And with these concrete tanks, there's not many other ways you can do it anyway. It's hard work. You'll see the guys are working hard. These tanks hold around 20 tonnes of fruit. That's not 20 tonnes of skins, of course, but we drain off uh, probably 50% of that as juice, and the rest gets shoveled out through that door. With the harvest almost over, Tony's taking time out to travel around the Bordeaux region. He's meeting up with the neighbours to find out their thoughts on this year's vintage. We're going to uh, the famous, famous Chateau Petrus. Probably the best known uh, estate in, in the whole of this part of Bordeaux. What they don't know um, isn't really probably worth knowing. The region of Bordeaux is the most famous in the world. There are just so many names synonymous with quality, tradition, and high price. But the name Petrus tops them all. Hello, Christian. Very pleased to meet you. Very pleased to meet yes. you again. It's been a very long time. Yeah, it's been too long. You probably don't remember. I came to interview you in 1967. <laughs> You were very young. Yeah, I was very young. Petrus is the outstanding estate in the district of Pomerol, making one of the most expensive wines in Bordeaux. On average, each bottle costs £1,000. And they only produce 4,000 cases in a good year. The Chez of Petrus. To a lot of people, hallowed ground. This is all there is, 2004 Petrus, to supply the whole world. Each barrel is 300 bottles. Uh, you can do a quick count. It's 100, getting on for 100 barrels. We think at this point that uh, Saint Emilion is a special success. So we have one that, it's almost too good. It's no visit to a cellar would be complete without a tasting of the wine, the newly made wine. And what does the owner of Petrus think about the 2005 vintage? Uh, more than a good year, it's a fantastic year. And which is great, I think it's for everybody to say. Everybody to say. You, have, you have the authority. Christian has spoken. It's fantastic. It, it, it is, but it is. Everybody says it. But if Christian says it, it certainly is. From the great estates of Bordeaux to the exclusivity of the Champagne Houses, the names inspire style, elegance, and grace.
Jean-Marc is visiting the man who was his deputy chief winemaker for 10 years, champagne producer Thierry Len. He's a flying winemaker who's had his wings clipped. I work for lightweights um, in Ardèche, in uh, Clan, in Saint-Tropez also, and uh, I used to be a roaming winemaker. And now his parents have retired, he's returned home to take over the family business. He now makes champagne exclusively for Lathwaite's, and he's made them a wonderful sparkling wine from the Burgundy region. I mean, this is a very special place because the wine and the champagne here is a real true discovery, is a true place. Thierry is a, is a real wine grower, a real champagne maker, and, um, and, uh, and this is why we like it so much. He's got, he's got personality. The wine got the personality of the man. And that's a nice personality, we like that. <laughs> we want so to have more of that. <laughs> Champagne winemakers use a very different method to make the wine sparkle. The wine is fermented twice, once in a tank when the grapes have just been picked, and then for a second time in the bottle itself. This is where the delicate bubbles are created. You know what is very special in champagne, what makes the champagne mystical and very special is like each bottle is a tank on its own. It's like you make a wine and you remake, you re-ferment it. That's why there's all these bubbles and the sparkling of champagne in the bottle. Imagine each bottle is a tank, is a tank on its own. It's got this kind of identity and, and that's, that's why it's so special. That's why it's also because of price. It tastes that good and also costs the price of his, of the champagne. Twisting the champagne bottles regularly is essential. It helps remove the sediment that forms during the second fermentation. It's very easy. You do like that, take your hands, tack, you carry on. And if you, if you fast, you do 50,000 bottles a day. And if you like me, very tired after five minutes, you do it for just one puppy. Thierry's allowed a little rest. He's been working hard on a sparkling wine in Burgundy and this exclusive champagne for UK customers. He's got this kind of nice biscuity nose and it's just, it's just pleasant. And it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a rich champagne. It's going to be, I believe, perfect for Christmas. Now the season is coming to a close, Tony's staying in the UK. His job from now on is to meet with the customers and find out what they really think of his wine. Tonight is his first post-harvest tasting, back in his wine bar. Oh, I've done a few of these in my time. If I could have your attention just for the next uh, two and a half hours, I'm going to be doing this tasting. We'll start with a sparkling wine, right? First of all, you undo the wire. Right? Never ever, when you're opening a bottle of champagne, um, take your thumb off that cork. Because they're tricky little buggers and they can just suddenly fly out. The thing is to, is to hold the cork and twist the bottle. And to be very correct and French about it, you don't pop it. You just go... <laughs> and there we go. All right, chaps. <laughs> Sparkling wine is the first time I've ever seen anybody drinking it and seen what the thing that but it was good. It was excellent. Sometimes you, you spend a lot of time with a wine. It's, it's particularly true for the guys who actually make it. They spent months, months making that wine. It gets to a point where they have no idea whether it's good or not because they just live with it all this time. And they hate the moment, really, that they've got to give it to somebody and get a, get a that or a that. But when they get a that, they are the happiest people on the planet. This one is called a melon. It's, it's a melon. What it's usually called is muscadet. I guess people think it tastes a little bit melony. And if you have a sniff at it, you maybe think it smells a bit melony. Any takers for this one? Yeah? A few nods, a few nods. All good so far. Winemakers are a funny breed, you know. None of them come into this business thinking, I'm going to make a load of money. They just like to make something and, and, and to give it to people and have people love it and get happy. Um, it's, it's, that's all it is. So we have three nice bottles of Les Abbey. 
And this is Andre. Andre, um, I met in 1970, 70, 71. A brilliant winemaker. He's also a very lovely, charming man. He officially retired uh, in, uh, in 1990, I think. And he was sitting there bored. And we thought, well, we'll, we'll, Andre, look, we'll give you a job to do. You can be our oldest flying winemaker, and we'll put you into a cellar, and you can do your stuff again. And he was delighted. Tony's been tasting with customers all his working life, an enjoyable job for a man with a passion for wine. I still get the same feeling to, to help bring something out and then show it to people, and they say, yeah. That's the greatest buzz, greatest buzz on earth, I tell you. I hope you will give Lathwaite's um, your, your custom in the future. I mean, you're not obliged to. And I hope you'll come to Redhead's Wine Bar a lot. They work very hard here. <laughs> Thank you, Star. Back in France, the region of the Ardèche is wrapping right. up yet another year's harvest. Flying winemaker Zane is preparing to leave the village he's spent the last three months living and working in. Before he goes, he has to ensure that all his wine is at the point where he can hand it over. This is uh, the Chardonnay tank, one of my Chardonnay tanks. I just want to make sure that I'm expecting the malolactic to have finished. I'm looking for bubbles, making sure it's full enough. It looks okay. Tomorrow, Zane and all the flyers are travelling to Bordeaux to Lathwaite's French HQ. They're to present their wines to Jean-Marc. It's the vintage moment of truth. OK, I'm preparing uh, a sample bottle to take uh, to Bordeaux, take the party in Bordeaux. This is one of the wines I want to show the gang over there. I think they'll like what they see. I'm looking forward to showing them uh, what we've done here this year. I'll be very happy to have their uh, opinions about how things went. Now it's time for Zane to say one last goodbye to the rustic village of Valvignere and its increasingly famous wines. I think we're making wines for whoever would like to drink them, whoever is interested in experiencing something from uh, a specific region, from a specific place. Uh, it would be good that uh, both People new to wine drinking and discerning drinkers enjoy uh, the wines that we make. It's late October and in Bordeaux the flying winemakers are gathering and it's judgment time for each wine. Jean-Marc and Christelle are the jury alongside Anne Linda from HQ in the UK. We're testing the end of the vintage. This is where, this is where we, we, we decide a bit or we have the best idea of how the vintage is going to be, how the wine is going to look like. Um, and and it's here is a, it's a kind of first big presentation to, to the buyer, to our manager. First up, it's Basque flying winemaker Maitena. She's had the hot, arid climate of the Midi to contend with. On top of all that, it's been her first solo job. The production of 20 barrels of Garage White has been the task. Ça, ça a été ramassé il y a quoi? Il y a deux semaines, pas deux semaines. Si, deux semaines. Well, we're finishing. We've been tasting uh, all the wine from Maitena. And, um, and we get things up. She's done a good job. Um, volumes are fine and, uh, and the style is respected, so it's very good. I'm happy. Merci, Benitana. <laughs> you star. She's a star. Next, it's Aussie winemaker John Adams. I, I... John's been working in the luscious landscape of Bordeaux, an impossibly one of the best vintages Bordeaux has seen for almost a century. Good news for the Lathwaite Sauvignon Blanc. Totally different style. Sauvignon Blanc again. John Mark gives us a pretty good brief on, on the style of wines that he wants. Um, so our job is to, is to come up with the goods, if you like. I like the palette on that. You see? Very grassy. Very peas. Peasy. It's always subject to year, it's always subject to fruit. Um, couldn't have got a better year than this year, so it was, was a breeze. Um, 
we didn't make good wine this year, we shouldn't be winemakers. Great, John. <laughs> Hello, Hi, everybody. How are you? Good to see you. How are you? Good to good. see you, too. And last but not least is the Greek New Yorker Zane. He's been working in the rugged region of the Ardèche, and since arriving, he's battled with the growers to make sure they get the best grapes, coped with lots of early mornings, and drunk a lot of coffee. But has he made a good wine this vintage? Now, this is, this is not necessarily any kind of blend that we like. There's a bit of sugar in some of this. How did the wines turn out? Well, it's still a pretty rough uh, state, but uh, they're looking uh, as I hoped they would look, given the good fruit we had. Zane is very, very good at um, selecting vineyard, and I think by doing less wine and being more choice in the vineyard, we're arriving to, to a time where, where it's good, it's very good. Zane, thank you very much. Thank you're you. star. You're Greek god. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> All right. I think uh, folks were very happy with what we've done, and I'm, I'm glad to get that feedback about what we need to do to make them better, make the wines uh, better. And with that, the winemakers can relax. It's time for a night off. I'm cooking meat for the guys. They've been working for me for hours. I'm working for them for one night. It's a good deal. They're all good characters. Um, they're slightly mad. Uh, I, I love looking after them because uh, if you look after them and they're happy, they will make happy wine. And happy wine tastes much better. And that's it for another harvest.